Part of Relationships Radio Show is copyrighted. No one is to use any part of the show without express written consent from myself, Greg Dzinski, or the Art of Relationships. Thank you. Welcome to the Art of Relationships Radio Show. Greg welcomes live calls from listeners in helping with numerous marital and relationship problems. There will be no more tit-for-tat arguments. Greg gets to the root of couples' challenges in a rapid, matter-of-fact format. Plus, applies compassion and humor. Join in discovering how to improve your relationship and your own life. Listen, laugh, and climax. Greg is a licensed professional counselor in the state of Michigan. To others, he's simply known as Detroit's love guru. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome. It's Wednesday night. It's hump night. So hopefully everybody's doing okay. Um, I am your host, as always, Greg Tuzinski. Detroit's love guru. I'm a licensed, fully licensed professional counselor, a relationship and sex specialist here in Metro Detroit area. So welcome. This is the Art of Relationships radio show. And we already have people joining in. So this will be very, very cool. Okay. Maya's in the house. Angie, what's up? Tracy, Cheyenne, happy hump night, everybody. <laughs> um, hopefully everybody's having a good week. Everybody's safe and sound. You know, there's a lot of stuff going around uh, the world and everything, so let's stay positive, okay? Tonight, it's going to be a difficult um, topic, if you will, uh, not only for me, but for listeners, because it seems like no matter where you go, no matter where you're at in this country, in America, you know, it could be here in the Midwest, the South, East Coast, West Coast, whatever, okay, Southwest, that addiction tends to hit home with a lot of people. It's very, very rare. I run into people, you know, even in, you know, my private realm, you know, the public realm and also in my office where addiction doesn't, let's face it, you know what? People aren't touched by addiction. It's very, very rare that I run into where they don't have a friend, they don't have a family member, maybe a coworker that is battling with addiction aspects, okay? And not gonna, you know, center so much about addiction, we're gonna get help, we all know there's AA, NA, Al-Anon, and all that might be great organizations. I wanna know and get into if you have suffered from an addiction, I wanna get both aspects, okay? If you're in a relationship with someone that has an addiction, be it a drug addiction, maybe a porn addiction, uh, sex addiction, gambling addiction, you name it, okay? People might have uh, addiction to a hobby. They might have addiction to other aspects, whatever. And would you call, you know, what about also with a, a disorder as far as bulimia, anorexia, those aspects too, would those be somewhat in the realm of addiction? And there's a lot of debate. Everybody says, you know what, uh, addiction is a illness. It's a disease. Is it? Or did it turn out to be a matter of a choice, okay? So you look at those elements and those battles, if you will, the societal battles and uh, how the propaganda is thrown at you, if it's a choice only that created the addiction, or is it an actual disease? And we can, I'm not going to get into a debate about that aspect too much, but I want to look at how addiction has affected you. Maybe you're a recovering, uh, a recovering addict, or also maybe you have been in a relationship, been married to somebody that has been an addict of one form or another, maybe an eating disorder as well, how it affected the relationship. And I'm going to ask you, you know, who dictates if you should tolerate the addiction, how long you tolerate it for, also, you know what, or do you walk away, you know, is it to death do us part type of thing? And how many people maybe have relatives, maybe you are one, that enables the addiction to go on? I know so many people over the past, you know, Greg, what do I do? You know, parents of, you know, they have adult children that are addicts that are they steal from them, okay? They rip off jewelry, money, guns, you name it, and they sell the stuff to go out to get stoned, to get, you know, to get high. And then they let them back in the house and they go out and they go out and pawn and steal stuff from the house again. And they go out and get stoned again. They let them back in. 
You know what? And it's very difficult because it's my kid. And then the guilt and the shame runs in. Did I do something wrong to cause the addiction, to cause you know that aspect, that behavior? So you sort of start enabling it by allowing them to come back home. So there's a lot of, like I said, a lot of emotional tug of war that goes on with addiction and relationships. And I want to hear your stories, of course. And you can give me a call. 313-614-9498. Again, 313-614-9498. And like I did last week, I am going to be raffling off free my book, or my latest book, I should say, uh, my second of uh, two books, The Relationship Guide, Tools to Ignite Love and Intimacy. It's right here, people. I'm going to be raffling it off to three viewers that share either live video or shared the post for uh, the radio show tonight that I did earlier today. So if you share that, you are going to be entered to win one of three copies of the book, okay? And, you know, like I say always, to give everybody a chance to win, those who have won a book, uh, maybe my first copy of my book or even the new one, you're not going to be eligible, but you know what? You're still going to be uh, please, I'm going to ask you to share, you know, share, go ahead and share uh, the video, the live feed as well. Grace, what's happening? Hey, welcome, Grace. Barb, a huge hello to you as well. I want to welcome all the new listeners or listeners, the viewers to the show. Um, as always, like I said, we're here every Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern time, Detroit time, New York time, same difference. Also, you can catch the audio versions alone on Spreaker.com iHeartRadio, TuneIn, uh, trying to think what else, Stitcher, there's a few other, iTunes I think as well, there's a bunch of other ones that you can catch the audio version, and that's on the flyer uh, before, uh, below this uh, live video feed, okay? So I want to welcome everybody, and as always, I want you to throw in your comments down below in the discussion. I want to, you know, your ideas, your insights about, you know, addictions, your battles maybe with addiction, and also maybe if you were the one that was living with somebody in love with someone that was had an addiction how did you handle it did you get out of that situation were you enabling it and we look at you know addiction cuts across not only the emotional aspect it kills trust with maybe money right spending money for drugs or gambling uh you know possibly losing your house getting evicted those aspects they all come you know, they all come to a head with addictions. And you look at, you know what, I feel guilty because, you know what, it's my loved one, it's, you know, my husband, my wife, my whatever. And the big, you know, epidemic we talk about with addictions in this country, probably the biggest epidemic we have, you know, is heroin, everyone talks about. But the other opiates that maybe go sort of underneath the radar is the opiate addiction in this country. Yeah, painkillers, right? Norcos, uh, we can go Oxycontin, you know, we can go the whole list of the opiates that, you know, are in the same class per se as, you know, morphine, as, you know, heroin, all those other uh, aspects that create issues. And you look at, it's devastating and it, it rips families apart and you look at, you know, do you have all that, you know, dedication, all that um, attention paid to the one that has the addict, you know, Addiction issue or challenge and do you ignore other family members or neglect other family members and it's hard right would you relate that any different if a family member had cancer you're gonna pay more attention to that whatever you know other child or other maybe adult child or parent or maybe your loved one has cancer you're so people are gonna get neglected now you look at most people let's face it we know you know, we don't choose to have cancer. And we can throw in, you know, addiction, smoking, right? Smoking might, you might get mouth cancer, lung cancer, that type of thing. And that's, well, you smoked, you knew the risk, right? Is that any different with maybe a heroin addiction or opiate addiction that maybe you chose to take on yourself, uh, crack addiction? We can go, you know, all over the spectrum with addictions, gambling addiction that you knew, the dangers you knew the possibility but yet you still chose to do those things and you look at you know we're going to talk about how it wreaks havoc on everybody else missy's in the house welcome 
Um, and I want to hear your stories and everything else about what happened to you if you were in love with a person that had that suffered from an addiction and how you handle it. And also, if you were, if you're a recovering addict, right? You're sober now, cleaned up, which is great. And I give you a lot of credit because it is not easy. Okay, you look at how many, how many chances. You know what? Were you thankful for your loved ones, your families for sticking by you? And do you look at, is there a limit? Is there boundaries that should be in place? You know what? How long do I tolerate this person going through rehab? Two, three, four, five. I, I, I know families that have family members that have been through rehab 10 times just in one year. And they still have issues. You know, it's hard. It's not, you know what? I'm not saying, you know, it's not easy. It's very, very difficult. It's very debilitating for family members and loved ones because you're always worried if they're late, if they're going to get high again, if they're going to relapse. It's a huge, huge element and epidemic in this country. And my question is, how long do you put up with it? Should you put up with it? And you know what? Is it society? Is it other family members that say you don't give up on loved ones? And who dictates those boundaries in the situation with addictions okay and it, it's a it's not an easy subject and it's very uh it's very difficult and i'm not one to say you need to stop doing this stop doing this when to give up or whatever that is up to you to decide and i want to know what some determining factors you might have and what you use um if it happened to you or maybe if you lived with it whatever and i know me um in my own personal life, am I going to be with somebody that has an addiction? No. Okay? But that's me. That's outside my professional realm. That's my personal, you know, take on my own personal life. And it's, you know, it's one of those things that it's very, very difficult to deal with. And I know myself as an individual outside my professional realm, you know, what I want, what I would deal with, what I won't deal with. And is that right or wrong because I'm in the helping profession? Again, people can judge me. I'm okay with that, okay? I'm confident enough to, you know, take on those judgments. So I'd love to hear you. And uh, as always, I want to hear, um, you know, give me a call again. And, you know, if you have questions that don't relate to this topic tonight, you know, relationships and addiction that don't relate, throw them in the discussion or give me a call, okay? Uh, 313-614-9498. Make sure you check out my website, theartofrelationships.org and again real quick I'm going to be raffling off three copies of my book The Relationship Guide Tools to Ignite Love and Intimacy and it's cool with the book I've been getting you know a lot of feedback and I you know I love feedback good bad and different it helps me grow helps me become better and one of the uh, most recent feedbacks I've been getting have come from four other people and I love it Greg it's like you know, I'm reading a book and it's like I'm in the room with you, like you're talking to me, like I'm right next to you, with you. I love hearing that. And then I started thinking, is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. Um, Sherry, welcome. Most of the time, the cause is due to the parents if and when young ones addicted. Now, now Sherry, I, I get that, you know, that's your opinion and everything. When you say it's caused by the parents, I want to hear more aspect of that. Now here, you know, a lot of, you know, we can get into the the causes of addiction. Is it because of the parents? And I, I've known a lot of families that they're good parents. They're, you know, no one's perfect, but they're good parents, they're decent parents, and all of a sudden their kid uh, becomes addicted. And it wasn't, you know, you look at, is it caused by a parents? We don't know what happens behind closed doors 24-7. You know, is addiction a personality thing? You got mixed up with the wrong crowd and is that the parent's fault? I, I can tell you a lot of times, Sherry, that that, you know, what you stated is not always the case. It might be the case in some situations, but it's not always the parent's fault that their adult child or whatever is an addict or becomes an addict. It could be their own self-esteem issues. It can be, you know, whatever goes on. You know, getting in with the wrong crowd, that type of thing, being rebellious, 
you know, a lot of situations can trigger addictions. Yes, there are cases where, you know, I, I, you know, with parents, they're freaking doing cocaine with their freaking 15 year old kid. They're doing, you know, smoking fatties, smoking, you know, blunts or, you know, doing bowls, marijuana, you know, with their freaking 14 kids. I get that. I get how, yeah, there are those parents out there, believe it or not. Yes that do our huge contributing factor, maybe start giving uh, their 16 year old kid or 14 year old kid, giving a, you know, giving them booze, giving them alcohol. Oh, as long as they drink with us in the house, no big deal. Those are contributing factors, Sherry, and I absolutely agree with you. Those parents need to be maybe hit over the head, big time. But again, I want, I want to get rid of the stereotype because someone has an addiction does not mean they've had crappy parents or crappy upbringings that that is a myth yeah there is a lot of addiction where there's been abuse and trauma i agree with you however that's not all the cases can i even say that's majority of the cases not not majority of the cases it could be maybe a 50 50 split or even you know maybe 60 40 but you're you're right sure i do give you that credit but we have to be careful it's not due to, you know what, some parents are trash, let's face it, okay? But not all parents are that way or, you know, toxic parents, if you will, unhealthy parents. Um, not all of them, and their kids still turn out, or adults turn out to be addicts, you know? So we have to be very, very careful on how we term that and how we use that and how we talk about it, not only with our kids, but with maybe our loved ones or relatives or even me out there. And, People that know me professionally, you know, as clients, people, you know, as former students when I taught college classes and people know me personally, they know I am not politically correct at all. Not at all. So I'm not, you know, being politically correct and stating this. I'm going by, you know, my own professional, maybe personal experiences, you know, with a lot of parents that end up having kids that are addicted. And yeah, they do have douchebag parents. But there's a lot of good parents out there, healthy parents, um, you know, nurturing parents, good. They set boundaries, discipline in a healthy forms, and their kids end up, you know, being adults and being addicted. It could be, you know, with coworkers, you know, they get a job, young jobs start working, they go out and they'll start doing lines of coke or whatever. Oh, I'm going to try it. Don't worry about it. And peer pressure. We, you know, all this stuff to fit in. And it might not have anything to do with toxic parents. So we need to be careful on how we form, you know, our, our basis for what we deal with, okay? So we look at all that aspect, okay? Um, hey, Heidi, what's up? Um, that is absolutely a myth as a recovering addict. Uh, for five years. Heidi, thanks for sharing that, and that is awesome, okay? And I, I agree that you can have great parents, and that's what I'm saying. It, it's it's a myth in a lot of aspects. Nikkei, welcome. Hey, I hope, uh, you know what, Nikkei, I just uh, mailed out your book yesterday. Was it today? Yeah, yesterday. And uh, hopefully you'll be getting that soon. Nikkei was one of the winners of the books last week, so congrats, you'll have that again. And I agree, Heidi, and that's what I'm saying, that was a myth. You know, about all, all addicts have bad parents. That's not always the case. Missy, you know, I'm a recovering drug addict and alcoholic, and I'm trying to get sober going to AA meetings, but I'm in love with an alcoholic. Should I let him go? <gasps> you know what, Missy? This has been a debate big time. You run, and you, you might know Missy, and you've heard stories, and I run into, you know, clients, you know, their spouses go to AA or they run up to AA and where do, you know, I got a couple in my office and they meet at AA, right? They meet at NA. It's very common. And you look at, do you build one dependency or addiction with another? And when you have two people dealing with, you might know and adjust everything, but do you start feeding off of each other? You know, not only the addictive tendencies, whatever, but how do you handle the healthy aspect when there's arguments, when there's high amounts of stress in a relationship and the trust issues about are you going to go back and be, you know, are they going to drink again? Are they going to use again? And is that a very 
unhealthy situation that you're setting yourself up for. I get it. We want to be loved. We want to be cared for. Yeah, they're going to get us because, you know what? They're an alcoholic just like I am. They're an addict like I am. We're going to relate. We're going to get to each other. But is that also toxic from the get-go? Now, you ask Missy, you know, I'm in love with an alcoholic. Should I let him go? And you know, Missy, you've been following the show for a long time. You know I'm not going to tell you what to do, okay? Um, I'm going to tell you and ask you, is that healthy for you? And you need to determine that. And if anyone tells you, you know what, I might say, maybe it's you're going to have a lot more challenges if he was not an alcoholic like you know you or you're getting sober. You're going to have a lot more stress. You're going to have a lot more maybe toxic situations. And how do you handle those stress situations together? in the trust factor about not going back to drink and you know relapse and all those aspects that's what I'm saying you're gonna have a lot more challenges and a lot more stress to deal with with both of you being you know trying to get sober and you know relapse prevention big time okay so with that given you decide what is best for you okay and I, I you've listened to the show a lot Missy and I've said this out you know a lot and I mentioned I tell clients all the time you know what you need to decide what is best for you I will help you get there but if I you know tell you you know that you need to stop you need to get away from this situation whatever that's bias and that's judgmental and people know me the time I might say you know what here's the information here says you decide what you want to do okay and I'm gonna tell you what the consequences are of your actions okay the only time I'm going to be more assertive or maybe even aggressive is when there's chronic domestic violence going on and, you know, maybe someone that's a chronic abuser and it doesn't stop, they don't want to get help. I'm going to be more assertive and say, you know what, it's probably a good idea. You need to get the hell out of that situation, okay, because this might not stop. If people are not willing to get help, then you have to look at, you know what, even me, I cannot help somebody that does not want to seek help. The couples I deal with, you know, even, you know, going through grief or going through trauma, loss, um, anxiety issues. If no one wants to get help, there ain't a damn thing I can do. So going back to your question, Missy, you need to do what's best for you. But look at, you are going to deal with a lot of stress, a lot more stress than people that are not, you know, suffering from addictions or alcoholism that you know what you're going to be dealing with a lot more stress you're going to be dealing with a lot more uncertainty not only within yourself but now you're wondering about trust factors with each other if they're going to drink if they're going to use so use that information and what's best for you i get you know love I, i'm a huge romantic and i'm all about the love and uh, the comfort and want to be loved all this stuff but you have to look at you know is it a can it be a healthy situation? Can you help each other in your sobriety? Absolutely, I'm all for that. But you have to look at, is there a healthy foundation from the get-go to try to build that, okay? <clears throat> uh, Cheyenne, you mentioned um, he's now my ex, but he is sober about 10 years now. Alcohol and heroin, yeah, I mentioned that big time. I choose not to drink while we were together, but he just substituted one addiction for another. It's gambling, steals, bad checks. I've already lost everything because of his addiction to lying. He don't see an issue. But eight years together and he still don't see the issue. Now that we're no longer together, emails from gambling sites, which makes me think he's using my name and info. And this is, Cheyenne, I'm glad you brought this up and I appreciate you sharing this. You know what? When there's addictions, and I, I don't know if you you were at the beginning of the show or not when I mentioned, you know, people enabling them, they're going to come back and they're going to do anything they can to feed that addiction. They're going to steal from you. They're going to lie to you. They're going to try to steal your identity. I can tell you numerous cases, Cheyenne, just like you've experienced, that they will try to steal your, you know, Social Security number and get credit cards in your name. And you're like, what the hell is going on? and credit fraud and bank fraud and maybe if you have checks they're gonna write these checks to cash and steal all these aspects and you know what they don't see it's an issue they don't want to get help and you look at you know is there an addictive problem or and I talked about this with a couple this week or is an addiction 
addictive personality. Cheyenne, it sounds like your ex, there is an addictive personality in your right. These individuals, it's not just one addiction. They are looking to substitute one addiction to another. And that's one thing, you know, I mentioned about AA might be a great organization, but, you know, you're, are you substituting one dependency, say alcohol, for the dependency, dependency of the group? And, you know, is one healthier than the other? You could be going to group five times a week. Yeah, I'm not drinking. You know what? I'm sober, maintaining my sobriety. <laughs> Terrific. But are you spending four hours every night, every day at group and not spending it with your family and everything else? And that's where addiction, it gets to be a delicate balance to where, you know what, you've got to work on yourself. And it's very difficult that you can center on a relationship or family while you're trying to, you know, get sober or get clean. So it's very, very difficult. And going back to my original question, people, you know what, would you be with an addict? For how long? And again, it doesn't, you know, I, I can tell you countless stories like Cheyenne shared below where, you know what, people have gotten their identity stolen, have used, open up credit cards, and you're getting, you know, you might break up with the relationship, and all of a sudden you find there's credit cards open in your name, bank account, whatever, and people are coming after you. They're suing you um, for bank fraud, for, you know, credit cards, and your credit is totally destroyed. And you know what? And then you're afraid, oh, they're an ex. I can't. They're already fighting with the addiction. I can't go after them and, you know, go after legal actions and prosecute them. You know, I can't do that to them. They're all right. And I'm like, screw that. You know what? It's my ass over their ass. They didn't care about me, so why am I caring about them? And, again, it is a very, very delicate, very delicate situation, okay? So... Um, your addiction tend to become each other. I, I agree in all this aspect. Missy, it's not always healthy and it's very hard, but it can be done. <coughs> How do I agree with that? Sure, you mentioned not many parents correctly raise or connect with their children and or wrong approach. Root causes why way of living and lack and fail to know how to parent. Parenting is very deep and complex matter. Sure, I agree with that. It is a very complex aspect. Outcome and results comes down to much, you know, heart and soul they put into their kids. I agree with that, Sherry, very much so. But again, I'm going to throw into you are, you know, you can put a lot of things into your kids, your heart and soul, and be there for them, and it can still turn out to be an addict. Not all the time. Yeah, you go with the percentages, absolutely. But we have to be careful again. That there are, you know, there are a lot of parents out there that do a good job. And like I said, nobody's perfect, but you end up being in a situation where, you know what, you have good kids, you know, good parents. You know, again, nothing's perfect, but you end up having a kid that ends up being an addict as an adult. And it's very difficult in how you, you know, how you base them. What do you go after, okay? My question, again, and I'm not getting a lot of... Um, a lot of feedback and a discussion about my questions to you people. <clears throat> what would you do if you learned or found out someone you were in love with, married to, was an addict? What would you do? I want to hear, I want to see your responses. And your questions, people. Uh, throw them out there. I'm going to take a little break. And... We're going to be back shortly, okay? Don't go anywhere. This is the Art of Relationships radio show. We're live on Facebook, people, every Wednesday night, 9 p.m., okay? Check out my website, theartofrelationships.com. Join this discussion below. I want to hear what you would do if you found out your loved one was an addict, okay? And how would you handle that situation, okay? I'm going to be back in a couple minutes. Enjoy the great pretender by Skyway Traffic. Waking up, kissing the floor of the bathroom stall. This isn't any way to live, no, not at all. And every one of these kids is so
people welcome back this is the art of relationships radio show i'm your host greg tozinski detroit's love guru people <laughs> uh licensed professional counselor relationship and sex therapist people again check out my website the art of relationships.org and tomorrow morning i am going to announce the winners the three winners of my book i'm giving away three more copies this week the Relationship Guide, Tools to Ignite Love and Intimacy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, I'm going to be giving those out. I'm going to show the winners right here on Facebook. I'll tag you um, on Facebook tomorrow morning with the winners, okay? And, oh, uh, announcement too. I did uh, advertising last week. Um, I am going to be uh, doing a webinar that is going to be offered in, uh, probably about, I'm going to shoot for two more weeks from tonight, uh, do a webinar going from anger to hurt to healing. It's going to be an hour and a half webinar. The cost is only 10 bucks for an hour and a half. And I'm going to, I'll have more information of that forthcoming. I have it all set up, designed. I'm going to be uh, going through, picking a day and time. It might be a weeknight. Uh, weeknight, maybe around 8 o'clock Eastern time. You know, kids are getting ready for bed and everything else. So look uh, look for more information to come. It's going to be another way for me to help you. You're going to actually be able to be heard and be seen. There's going to be live audio, live video, live chat where you can interact just like we're in the same room, like a video conference aspect webinar. So it's not just your typical webinar where you're going to add chat. You're going to be asking questions. You're going to be verbally being able to ask questions, not just type them out. So you're going to be able to do both. Okay. So look forward to information coming about that. And we're talking about addiction and a relationship. And what the hell would you do? Um, would you stay with someone in addiction? Would you you know, be there for them? Would you be emotionally supportive for them? Or would you be saying, peace out, you're dismissed? And this is a very subjective aspect um, 
this is a very difficult situation to deal with and what would you do how long would you put up with it and how long should you put up with it and it's again this is very subjective people I don't want you to have society dictator friends family co-workers you know what if it was my kid I'd be dead uh, out the window if it was my wife my husband I'd kick their ass to the curb it's easy for other people to say this and you know go through this but it's very very difficult when it's someone that has your heart and you know there's a difference between enabling it and being supportive with these situations however do you end up you know what how long do you put up with it how much work do you put into it for these people your loved one to get help and what happens are you doing a lot more effort to help them than they are willing to help themselves okay and we know with addiction you know self-esteem issues there could be you know they're only focused on getting the next fix getting the high taking that next drink the the next fifth or whatever those situations and it's hard because their whole focus it, I shouldn't say their whole focus but the majority of their focus is maintaining on where they're gonna get that next fix do I have enough money you know what you can't pay your bills but you're going out getting stoned on heroin on crack on whatever cocaine you know are you alcohol maybe you're going out buying a 40 buying you know a jumbo a six-pack and you can't even afford to pay your electric bills or have food in your house these are issues that affect you know not only you know relationships they affect family members and how would you handle those situations and what would you do these are questions for thought I don't ever want somebody to be you know in a situation where they're facing an addiction or you know what that they're living with someone that's an addict but it happens it happens a lot as you can tell you know with the discussion below how many people it's affected already just on discussions I you know like I said it's very rare that you are gonna run into somebody that has not themselves dealt with a loved one that had an addiction or knows has a good friend that is battling someone that is, has an addiction it's very difficult okay um, Cheyenne you mentioned can be supportive help and encouraging but can't enable them and this is a very very you know difficult situation you know what is the difference between enabling them and being supportive yeah I'm gonna support you with this but I'm not gonna give you you say you need money for food you know what I'm gonna go buy you food I'm gonna be you know being downtown Detroit my where my office used to be you know homeless people and I'm all about you know hope donating little you know change money dollar here five dollars here and also buying them food right and it's funny how many people when you you know they want money for food and you know I'm gonna buy you food and then they sit there no no I don't want food you know, screw you no, no, I'm not you know not all you know thank you so much whatever very grateful for that but you know the people that are facing addictions they don't want food they want money so they can go buy booze they can go get their next crack fix or heroin fix those are the issues where you be supportive and enabling them you know what I'm gonna get not gonna give you money but I'm gonna go and buy you food I'm gonna get you you know whatever <coughs> maybe house supplies you know whatever you need you know I need you know maybe hygiene supplies right deodorant shampoo you know whatever you know body wash whatever you need toothpaste you know I'm gonna buy this stuff for you but I'm not gonna give you money so you're gonna cuz I don't trust you well you don't trust me whatever you know what you gotta earn that trust just like everybody else you know I deal with affairs on a regular basis in my office that trust cannot be just giving I should not be just giving I should you know reframe that so trust has got to be earned and with addictions they're gonna try to manipulate you if you don't love me you really don't care you don't love me you don't care I'm all this because they want that fix and that's the difference between enabling a loved one with an addiction versus helping and being supportive enabling is oh here's money and you know damn well they're not gonna go buy toiletries they're gonna go you know they're gonna go buy you know booze alcohol they're gonna get try to get a crack fix a heroin fix whatever 
with that money, and you know it, but oh my God, I can't say no and make it worse. Uh, they might not come back. They might end up whatever. Well, I hate to tell you this. That is enabling behavior, and you trust your gut instinct to understand is that, you know, my gut tell me I'm being manipulated and I'm being made to feel guilty, and if they don't, you know, you look at that, that's going to be a sign you're enabling them versus supporting them. When you know in your gut you're doing the right thing and you're able to stand your ground and say, no, like I mentioned before about going after, I'm going to buy you necessities. I'm going to help you with that. However, I'm not giving you damn money to go out and with the potential to buy booze, to buy fix, or go down to the casino or sports betting. You know, whatever your addictive fix you need or want, I'm not going to allow that, okay? <clears throat> so there's a big difference between enabling and being supportive, as Cheyenne mentioned. So thank you, Cheyenne, for mentioning that and sharing your story as well with everybody else. So it's very, very difficult. Um, oh, Pam, hey, welcome. Um, Pamela, thank you for that. My boyfriend has court-ordered seven months rehab. <clears throat> and that, that is a long time. Most in Michigan here, a lot of rehabs might be court ordered 28 days, 30 days. Seven months is phenomenal. And I, I don't know, Pamela, what state you're in, you know, if you want to share that information or whatever. But um, comes home November the 9th. That happens to be my uh, sister and brother in law's anniversary then, anyways. But, and it's very difficult. And Pamela, if you'd like to share you know, what you deal with and maybe what, what fears you have and have you dealt with this very thing about, you know, being supportive and what you put up with, what you don't put up with, um, you know what, and is that a healthy relationship for you and are you in that relationship because you feel guilty, you feel, you'll feel, you know, guilty or shameful if you left, oh my God, I left them when this time of need and you look at, you know what, would he have gone to rehab without being court ordered? And we in Michigan, there's a lot of, you know, there's drug court and all this stuff. But it's funny how a lot of victims, you know, where there's, they get houses broken into and stealing things. And it seems like the victim, innocent victims that get their houses broken into by addicts, they have less rights than the freaking addict does when they go in and break in a house and steal stuff and all this stuff. And to me, I'm not into that, and I'm like, you know what, you need to take care of this crap now, and the people, the innocent victims, you need to, you know, the court systems need to be more empathetic and more caring to the victims of these, you know, situations than to the addicts themselves, and like I said, the debate is, and I'm not going to throw it up there, you know, being an addiction is an initial choice, the battle between a choice and a disease, you know what, it, it's a fine line, right? Did you choose knowing you could possibly become an addict and you still did it anyways, right? And I get, you know, with trauma, sexual abuse, all this stuff that creates the aspect to where you might want to use to get rid of the pain or you might want to drink to get rid of the pain. Have you tried other avenues and all this aspect? And again, I'm not saying it is easy whatsoever. Everybody has their own demons. Everybody in these situations you know what, is it an excuse, is it a reason, or is it a justification? And I'm very empathetic and compassionate towards people. And these are just questions I pose to everybody else, okay? Again, you know, I don't have all the answers by any means. I'm just, I do try to help. So you look at the situation, Cheyenne, you mentioned, yes, he got pissed when his parents would let tell him to make a list of what he needs, and they would go get it. He flipped all the time because nobody trusted him. Yes, I heard all the manipulation. You don't trust me. Don't love me. If you love me, da 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 da. Cheyenne, thank you. That's exactly what I was saying earlier, as you said. You know, the manipulation. You don't trust me. You don't love me. Or you do this. You know what? You're damn right I don't trust you. You need to earn that trust and not play the victim and try to make me feel guilty. And that's where you got to stand strong and look at. You don't care. If you're in an addiction, I'm trying to help you. And you don't care how your actions affect me, you don't give a shit about that, you know what, why am I going to help you? And it's a big battle, it's an it's a emotional battle, it's a, it's a tug of war emotionally, what 
what to do, what not to do, how much to do. You know, and we talked about, you know, like I said, the difference between enabling and encouraging your loved one that has that aspect, okay? Again, it's not easy. It's not an easy situation to deal with, and it's, it's a huge battle. Um, <coughs> hey, Cynthia, welcome. Yeah, that is an understatement. I, Cynthia, yeah, welcome. I, a huge friend of mine, huge friend of the show, um, great person. And uh, Pamela, you mentioned, no, this is the last time. He is not like that. He has never stolen anything. He actually is functional. And I get this a lot, and a lot of times, you know, you hear about uh, a functional alcoholic. I, I, when I worked for, you know, one of the big threes, UAW hourly employee for a lot of years, yeah, I worked with a lot of functioning alcoholics. And you look at what factor does that have on your life and a relationship, and you're right. Everybody, and it's maybe more difficult because they're functioning. You know, it's it's more difficult. But it tells me if he was more function, you know, he was functioning alcoholic or an addict. That you know what, getting court ordered to rehab for seven months. That tells me he was he is an habitual offender. Okay, functioning or not, tells me why is he in court then. And why was he court ordered for seven months? And I'm not being a dick, Pam. I'm trying to throw out some information out there because it's it's very rare that someone is going to be court ordered for the first time for seven months. And that doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter what state you're in. It's I'm, that is something tells me he's been court ordered to rehab before or has been in jail because of alcoholism or drunken excursions or DUIs. There's been a history for him to be court ordered to seven months. And this is one of those things you look at. You know, you said this is the last time, and I'm glad you set boundaries for yourself. And you know what? People that are, you know, have loved ones with an addiction, you know, are in a relationship with an addict or alcoholic, you know what? You need to set boundaries for yourself. Nobody determines those but you, okay? Now, you might lose friends. You might lose other family members not going to talk to you. You know what? I need this money because they, to pay the bills when they went out and snorted, you know, or shot up crack cocaine or heroin addict, you know, stolen stuff and all this time, and you're trying to help pay bills. But And then you're enabling that person. You're still with that person, but you want other people to help you out because you need bills paid. Your, you know, power is getting shut off. You have no food because... The person you're with, husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, is an addict, and they're using money. They're selling stuff, all this stuff, and you're asking other people for help when you're still with that person. They're going to tell you no. Maybe they should tell you no, or I'm, you know, set limits. I'm going to help you this time, but there's not going to be any more times to help you. And it's very, very difficult to stay strong in those convictions um, to deal with those, okay? So it, it, it's not easy. And like I said, I am not the one to tell you what you should do. I'm here to tell you what the consequences are and, you know, to look at yourself in those situations, you know, how do you deal with those situations, okay? It's difficult. Um, well, he got two years probation and a restricted license. Um, no, Pam, thanks for saying, yeah, it's habitual because, uh, he was selling drugs, so he's not only an addict, he was selling drugs too. So that is a different situation as well. You know, I look at selling drugs as differently than be you know, in an addict type of situation, you know, and I look at those two separate entities big time when he was younger, I get that. And you look at the dynamics, you know, how do you do that and what do you do, how long you should stay, and again, that's not up to me to decide that it's up to you to decide. The only thing I'm trying to do is maybe wake you up, wake people up to see are you enabling the behavior or are you being supportive and then there's a time where you know what, I'm setting boundaries for myself and I'm going to you know, not be supportive any longer because I'm losing myself, I'm losing my identity and it's ruining my life, my you know, sense of health dealing with this situation and this addictive problem. And again, it's very subjective, and you need to look at, you know what, our people, they're not helping you anymore because you're enabling your partner. 
I get it. And that's one thing I want you no one's helping me all this problem I'm dealing with it because you're still dealing with that situation and there's not been any changes. So look at the differences between you being supportive emotionally and you being maybe enabling because of your own guilt and shame and how you feel. Um that maybe oh if they you know what, this throws gets thrown in and I know we brought this up and Cheyenne, you mentioned this before. And I mentioned about the, oh, you don't love me, whatever. You're not helping me. If you really love me, you'd help me and you deal with this. You know, after five times, six times, ten times, twenty times, you know what? Do you love me enough to keep putting me, maybe you don't love me, to keep putting me through this. You know what? Not a tip for tap, but maybe you don't love me enough to stop your shit or to get help. Maybe I need to throw that out there at you too. It's about self-love. It's about self-respect, self-care when you set those boundaries. And it's, again, it is not an easy situation. And it's a huge epidemic here in America. I wish it wasn't, but you look at the situation, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Cynthia, I think one thing so many don't realize is how hard it is to treat the addict who doesn't want help. Cynthia. Oh my God, you always chime in later after I talk about this stuff. <laughs> no, um, they have to be ready to help themselves and often get worse when forced into treatment. Cynthia, thank you very much. I mentioned this very thing, you know, earlier, probably about 20 minutes ago. Um, I mentioned that no matter what, you cannot help somebody that doesn't want to get help. This goes with addiction. This goes with relationship issues, you know, with anything. You know what? If they don't want help, there's not much you can do. You can be supportive and say, you know what? I'm here, whatever. But you can't, you know, drag somebody kicking and screaming to get help. Now, court ordered, that might be a way to get help, okay? But a lot of people, oh, my God, I can't call the cops on my husband, my wife. I can't do this because the court. And then we talk about not only, you know, we talk about stealing and thieve, you know, the thievery and you know, all that aspect to support a drug habit or an addiction, gambling aspect too. But, you know what? What about the legal costs on top of that? That you're helping somebody try to get help. You know, lawyer costs, court costs, fines. Um, dealing with all those aspects. So it is. It's very, very difficult. I, you know, I'm going to tell you, I have not found a way yet with my clients over the 16, 17 years I've been doing this. Um, with couples or anybody else about wanting to get help. Um, you know what? They don't want to get help. It's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to help those individuals out, okay? So again, look at, are you enabling the situation? Are you being supportive? And are you setting boundaries for yourself when enough is enough when dealing with, you know, maybe a loved one with addictive uh, personality or an addiction that isn't seeking help? that you love yourself enough to not get played and not get manipulated. <laughs> sorry, people. Not get manip manipulated. I can't even talk tonight. Sorry. Manipulated in those situations. Um, again, it, it's very, very difficult, okay? Um, yeah, I know, Cynthia. Leave it to you to be late for the party. I get all that, okay? It's huge, okay? Um, Pamela, I have set myself up with a job and stability while he has been gone and have set boundaries. If they are not met, he cannot come home. <laughs> Pamela, that is so awesome. That is good for you. Now, what happens if you are challenged with that? I have nowhere to go. If you really love me, you know what? I did this. I did seven months of rehab. I did all this aspect. You know what? Are you going to hold true to your own boundaries? going to be difficult. You will be challenged. I hope you're up for the challenge. Um, you need any help, anybody needs help, you know, I tell people, private message me, you know, do those situations, whatever you need, okay? Um, good luck. Hopefully this information is helpful to you, but, you know, more or less, it helps you think and gain more insight into how would you handle a situation. And if you are in a current situation with an addict, um, to provide insights to get you to think what you would do, what you should do, and to reach out to get help, you know, Al-Anon, you know, all those, you know, everyone knows, you know, there's AA, um, 
drug abuse hotlines in your area nationwide, um, Al-Anon, those aspects to try to get help and you can present the information. But someone with an addiction, they're not going to get help until they're ready or willing to get that help, okay? And we all know some people might go to rehab for a week and I'm like, you know what, what the hell does that do? It might get you clean, but a week is, it's not much, okay? Oh, I'm done, I got help, but it's just like a Band-Aid. You know what? And you're supposed to trust them in all those aspects. It doesn't work that easy. It's very difficult, okay? So, peace and love to everybody out there. Again, I'm going to be listing the winners, the three winners of my book, The Relationship Guide, Tools to Ignite, Love and Intimacy. Um, that I'm going to be announcing tomorrow morning as usual. Three winners. And you can purchase the book in ebook or paperback on Amazon.com and also BarnesandNobles.com, okay? Check out the website, theartofrelationships.org. Thank you for viewing the show, people, for spending your time with me, the new uh, viewers of the show. I appreciate it very much, okay? Love, peace to everybody out there. Let's spread the love. Let's spread the peace. Let's get rid of racism. Let's become one people. Peace, baby. Take care.